My name is Michelle, and I will be your moderator for this class. Welcome to the Madison, Wisconsin Branch School. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Madison branch was established in 1987. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is a title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus or Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our father and his son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable, is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a superincorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of a holy name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place, and a court roundabout. 
these three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. First, help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, the devil, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which is once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And 10th, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. Our scripture reading for tonight's class will be Psalms, the 19th chapter, and that will please be read by Dr. Delilah Tucker of our Madison branch. And if we could start the evening off with a prayer from Dr. Rick Ensenroth, also of the Madison, Wisconsin branch. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Let's all take a moment our minds. Thank Yahweh for giving us this great teaching. Keep us open-minded and keep us loving the truth. In Yahshua's precious name, I ask these things. Hallelujah. 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 Good evening, class. I'll be reading um, Psalms, the 19th chapter. <clears throat> the heavens declare the glory of Yahweh, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul, the testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse, me, cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression, that the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Yahweh, my strength and my redeemer. Thank you. Our readers this evening will be myself and Drs. Dennis and Andrea Volpe of the Oceanside, California Branch School. I'd like to take a moment and welcome everyone to class this evening. It's good to see everyone here. We do have a returning visitor and also a first time visitor tonight. And with that, we will call on our first speaker this evening, which will please be Dr. Sasha Rockmillievich of the Madison, Wisconsin class. Uh, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me well? We do. Loud and clear, Great. Sash. So it's, uh, thank you. It's good to be here and I'm uh, very happy that we have a new time visitor uh, with us. Uh, welcome, you know, and uh, I talk on behalf of myself and I'm sure other people that we are all uh, excited to have you here because there is a very important things we would like to share. So as I understand, you know, the uh, background of uh, our visitor is such that uh, it's not, uh, you know, heavy involved with the religion or uh, Bible studying, kind of similar to my background when I was in Soviet Union. And that's what I want uh, to share first, probably give a, a quick testimony uh, about how I came to class. It's going to be really quick because I want to go to the uh, meat of the teaching. But I was raised uh, uh, in uh, Soviet Union and as many majority of the people in the Soviet Union, uh, I was not uh, religious. Uh, we were taught in Soviet Union that uh, religion is opium for masses. Uh, most of the people didn't believe in God, including myself and those people who did believe, they usually would hide it because it was not safe uh, to say that openly. You, won't, you couldn't find the Bibles in the bookstores. So I didn't uh, read the Bible. I didn't know the Bible. And little bit I knew the Bible. It's from art museums, from reproductions of uh, the paintings, which had some religious um, themes. And uh, uh, the art experts would say a little bit what Isaac and Abraham, for example, who they are and what this patent uh, depicts. That pretty much was the extent of my knowledge uh, about the Bible. But as long as I remember myself, I always wanted to know about the meaning of life, why I am born, what's my purpose in this life, what happens when people die. I was reading the books of the uh, philosophers, but I couldn't find uh, the satisfying uh, answer because different uh, philosophers or writers would have their own opinion about this particular uh, subject. So then uh, 32 years ago, I came to the United States and uh, with my family and people start taking us to different churches and introduced us uh, to the Bible. My uh, friend from work uh, gave me and my wife uh, the Bibles in Russian at that time. And uh, so I started reading the Bible and I became uh, interested and I uh, started going to the Christian church and listen to the uh, Christian pastors. But I always had the questions in my mind. What does it mean? Uh, because when I hear uh, different preachers talk about the Bible, they uh, would contradict to each other. One people think that this place in the Bible means this and that. And another uh, 
was saying otherwise. There are four, there are so many uh, denominations in Christianity. In fact, if you even Google it, you'll find that they are, there are thousands, thousands of different denominations of Christianity, meaning people use the same book, the Bible, but argue with each other what this uh, book means. So I got an impression that it's impossible uh, to know uh, anything about God, even if God is real or not, it wasn't clear uh, because the experts in the field, you know, people who graduated the seminary school didn't know uh, what the Bible meant. Then, uh, to, to make a long story short, uh, I was invited by a co-worker to attend one of these classes. And the first uh, thing I heard, uh, among other things uh, in the introduction, is that, or during the first lecture, is that the founder of the school by name of Henry uh, Kinley, he claimed that he had the divine vision and revelation from the creator himself. So uh, in other words, he said that God himself appeared to him and told him uh, the truth about uh, the Bible and the truth about the questions I always wanted uh, to know the answers to. What's the purpose of life? Now, but he didn't only say that, he said, let me prove it to your uh, satisfaction. Now, by profession, I'm a scientist. So to prove things is uh, what I do for the living. So, and, uh, so I start coming to these classes with this, with this thought in my mind. So when I heard that he had a vision and revelation from God, I thought, like other people uh, in uh, some religious uh, doctrines like Joseph Smith in the Mormon religion, for example, there are people who claimed having visions from uh, God. And I thought that this man probably uh, 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 not honest, uh, a charlatan or somebody like that. But still on the back of my mind, I thought, well, if it's 1% of point, uh, find one percent of possibility that this man actually uh, had a vision and revelation from God, then I will be able to know the truth. That's what I wanted to know. So and my testimony that, uh, you know, during uh, my, I uh, didn't even count, I think it's, 27 years or so being in this class, it's been proven to me that this man did have a divine vision and revelation. And hopefully during this uh, short lecture, I will uh, uh, show some evidence to you that this is the case. So let me uh, uh, show the screen, uh, uh, try to share the screen. Um, please, whoever is in the in the church of the charts, can I show the screen? Okay, I think I can. Thank you. So let me know if you see this picture on the screen. It's there. Got it. Great. You see it better now? Okay, yes. so this is the picture of uh, Michelangelo from Sixteen Chapel, the creation of Adam. <clears throat> and I was familiar with this uh, painting in uh, Soviet Russia. And that's pretty much how I uh, visualize God. But again, for me, at that time, God was a fictional uh, character, not really, a, uh, real. So the questions uh, I had, let me see, was how to know if God is real? 
how to know if the Bible is true. And does science contradict the Bible? Because, uh, you know, many people, including especially scientists, say that the science contradicts uh, the Bible and therefore the Bible is not true. If the Bible is not true, we cannot believe it and therefore we cannot know anything about God because God reflected and described himself uh, in the Bible. So these are the questions I will uh, try to address in this uh, short presentation. So what does the Bible say about it? Can somebody uh, uh, read it from the screen, please? This is from the Bible, from uh, the New Testament of the Bible. The Bible is divided into Old Testament and the New Testament of the Bible. And there is explanation to it, but it's not in this lecture. So please. Okay. This is read Romans 1 is and 19 through 20. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. For Yahweh hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So to, uh, in another words, kind of to simplify, is Yahweh, which is the name of uh, God. So Yahweh, according to the Bible, so Yahweh or God is invisible. But what he did, he made this creation, including you and I, and uh, this creation, the purpose of this creation is to manifest uh, these invisible things of uh, God. In other words, uh, the visible things or the things which God or Yahweh created, they manifest or uh, explain the invisible uh, things of him. So let's uh, try to understand that, that in the scripture reading before class, we read that the whole universe, the heavens and such, they all proclaim the glory of Yahweh. So it's the same thing in a different part of the Bible, saying that what's created is uh, uh, illustrating or manifesting our creator. So we can know about him uh, from the things that he made. So what did he make? In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, it says that God or Elohim, which is the Hebrew title for God, God created man in his own image. So I, as an intellectual person back in Soviet Union, knew this particular verse even without reading uh, the Bible. It's kind of certain things from the Bible are known, uh, were known back then. What's another thing? Uh, if somebody can read uh, this quote from Hebrews. Elohim created man in his Michelle? own. Andrea, okay. are you reading the Hebrews 8 and 4 on the screen? Yes, could you guys hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, C continue. Okay. There You're are, doing good. Thank mm -hmm. you. There are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of Elohim when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Thank you. So here it says that this uh, tabernacle and the priests who serve in this tabernacle, they are example and shadow of heavenly things. And what are the heavenly things? This is God or Elohim or our creator is heavenly things. So in other words, we have that man is made in the image of God, 
and tabernacle is made in the image of God or serves as an example and shadow of invisible God. And I'll talk about this tabernacle uh, a little bit later. So God or Yahweh, he is invisible and he reflected himself in the man and he reflected himself in the tabernacle according to the Bible. Now we are going to test if the Bible is true and how to test it. So if this thing is true, then the man and the tabernacle should correlate with each other because they both reflect the same invisible uh, Yahweh. Let me give you an example. So here, you can see two copies or examples or shadows of the person, of the real person you uh, cannot see in real life because he died long time ago. This is uh, Leo Tolstoy, the famous Russian writer, the author of War and Peace. On the left side, there is a photograph of Tolstoy. The right, on the right side, there is a painting by Ilya Repin, a famous uh, Russian painter of uh, Tolstoy. But you can recognize the similarity between them, although it was taken at a different time by different people using different means, photographs or uh, oil and uh, canvas. But they, because they both reflect the same person, you can see the similarity. In the same way, we are going to see the similarities uh, between the man and this tabernacle. So what is this tabernacle? So this um, chart, among other things, it depicts the uh, Bible story, famous Bible story of Exodus of children of Israel out of Egypt. So it consists of three parts. You can see this is Egypt. I'm pointing at the lower part of the chart. Then middle part of the chart is the wilderness of Sinai and the upper part is the Canaan's land. So what happened is when the Moses led children of Israel out of Egypt, he came on the top of the Mount Sinai and God or Yahweh uh, gave him or uh, showed him in the vision this uh, pattern of this tabernacle. And yet he told Moses to build exactly uh, like this, you know, in the wilderness. So that's what you see in the wilderness. This is a tabernacle being built. It's all described in the Bible. Now this tabernacle is described in details with the measurements in 50 chapter of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the Bible. And what this tabernacle was, it was the tent. And this tabernacle served for the uh, children of Israel to bring sacrifices and for the priests to uh, service and to serve in this tabernacle. So it was a tent, it was like a primitive church, uh, so to speak. And uh, how it looked like. So this is another vision uh, of you of this tabernacle. So this is like a, a gates or it's a court round about this tent. You see, this is a tent within the court. And uh, uh, this uh, tent consisted of uh, two parts as I will show uh, later. So this is another view of this tabernacle. Again, this is a court which is goes round about you can see the altar of sin sacrifice in this court, and you can see the labor of water. I can talk about, I will talk about it later on. And then you see, you know, this tent, which is closed by the veil, and there were two parts in this uh, tent. And around this tent, there were children of Israel camping in the wilderness. 
Now, if you look at this tabernacle pattern, uh, like uh, in more details, this is the court again, which we saw on the pictures before, going around, uh, around about this tabernacle. And there are two other sections or parts in this tabernacle. This is the holy place and the most holy place, you know, within this tent. In other words, tabernacle consists of three parts, most holy place, holy place, and the court going around about. So why there are three parts? Because it's a reflection or a type and shadow of heavenly things of our creator. And according to the Bible, our creator is the father, he is the son, and he is the Holy Spirit. It's like three different manifestations of the uh, spirit. I don't have time to go uh, over it, uh, but it's one uh, God or one Yahweh or one spirit. The same way there are three sections or parts in this tabernacle, but there is one tabernacle. Now, this tabernacle was the pattern. It's taught in the Bible, in the Bible about the pattern of the tabernacle. Why it's the pattern? Because we will see that by this pattern, everything was made. So it was like a blueprint by which our creator made the creation, including man and including uh, the smallest uh, uh, parts of the creation. For example, look at this picture. On the left side is this tabernacle. On the right side is atom. Atom consists of three parts. It consists of uh, protons depicted with red, neutrons depicted with uh, blue, and electron going around this nucleus consisting of proton and neutron, like this cord was going around about of this nucleus uh, consisting of tent, consisting of the most holy place and the holy place. So the atom is, uh, correlates with this tabernacle and it reflects, also reflects our creator, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why atom is threefold. So what about the living matter? Atom is uh, organic and non-organic matter. What about living organic matter? So look at the cell. The basic uh, uh, structure of the cell, you see the uh, nucleolus, nucleus, and the cell body. So the same way as you see most holy place, holy place, and the court round about. Again, another witness that this tabernacle is the pattern of everything which is created. Now, what about the human body? So the, if you look at the human body, let's talk in general first, and then in details uh, later. And from the beginning, I would say, there are many details. We won't have two hours to talk about all different details. I'm just giving you the overview of this because I don't want to take all time. It will be another speaker, so the speaker uh, after me. So as a tabernacle consists of three main parts, most holy place, holy place, and the court route about, our physical body, consists of three uh, parts or three sections or three cavities, which we cannot live without. This is um, the head cavity, chest cavity, and abdominal cavity. You can ask, what about uh, uh, hands? What about legs? Uh, people can live without 
hands and legs, but without these three parts, either of them, the person cannot live. So you see the similarity in this overall makeup of the uh, physical body. And there are correlations with the hands and the legs with the purpose of Yahweh, but I don't know if I will have time uh, to go into it. Now, let's go into this different uh, parts of this uh, uh, tabernacle and uh, the man. And uh, remember, so I'm, try I'm trying to prove, to give you the evidence that the uh, anatomy and physiology of uh, human body correlates with the structure of the pattern. Uh, why? Because they reflect the same invisible creator or they were made by the same pattern. So if you look at the court roundabout first, so you will find the first uh, vessel uh, there. It was uh, the altar of sin sacrifice. Now the Israelites who sinned had to bring uh, the sacrifice like a lamb and burning on this altar. So this altar was in square configuration. There were four points of blood on these corners of this altar and all of it you can read in the Bible. So if you're interested after class, ask me and I give you the verses where everything is described. And it was a constant burning on this altar. And uh, the principle of the sacrifice was that something innocent, like this lamb, innocent animal, had to die so that guilty person who sinned will live. So it was a, a sacrifice uh, for the life of the person. Now, if you go to the physical body, you will find that in the physical body, you'll have a large intestine, which consists of uh, uh, four, uh, four parts. It's uh, a colon, ascending, uh, transverse, and descending colon. And it's uh, fed by uh, four colic arteries, which gives it four points of blood. Now within this uh, uh, large intestine, there is a small intestine, which is really kind of a, having a convoluted uh, configuration, if you look at the anatomic atlas. And it's uh, likened to this gradient uh, system. It's like a barbecue, like, uh, uh, gradient system on the altar of uh, 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 sacrifice. And as it was a constant burning uh, in the tabernacle, it was a con constant burning in the human body or cons constant uh, uh, digestion of the food is happening in the intestine. Again, the gate, uh, I mean, not the gate, but altar, of sacrifice and our intestine, they don't look alike. But the function, invisible function is the same. What's the function? Something innocent need to die so the person can live. It was in the tabernacle and the same in our physical body. So something innocent, whether it's uh, lamb or chicken or cow, need to die so we can eat steaks or, or chicken or meat or plant, which is a, a living a, a, a creature, living substance, need to die if you are vegetarian so you can uh, eat uh, bread or, uh, some, uh, or different vegetables. So, so it's the same uh, principle here. Now, the second vessel in this tabernacle was the labor of water or basin with water. It was uh, made of uh, brass. And so it was a uh, uh, yellow uh, color. And the function of it 
was for uh, the priests to wash hands and to wash uh, some inner parts of the sacrifice in this labor. So the function was cleansing uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this water. Now, when we go to our physical body, we see the kidneys. Kidneys, if we bring them together, they will also have oval configuration, like uh, the slaver of water had oval configuration. And uh, uh, this uh, water, if you look at it, it was yellow in, uh, in color uh, because it was uh, kind of reflecting, uh, you know, the uh, uh, bronze it was made uh, uh, from the same way as uh, uh, urine is the uh, yellow uh, color. And uh, the function of uh, our kidneys is uh, to cleanse uh, the blood, the same as the function of uh, this labor of water. So the next, what, we, what was uh, the next thing which was happening in the court roundabout of this tabernacle of, uh, or uh, primitive uh, church at this time is that this uh, priest, which is depicted here, uh, they had to pour the, uh, uh, it's called holy anointing oil on this priest so then the priest can go to the holy place in the tabernacle and serve it without any mistake. So this, uh, so the function, it was like a, a perfect uh, functioning uh, in this uh, tabernacle or quickening. So above our uh, kidneys, you can find uh, adrenal uh, glands and uh, adrenal glands uh, secrete uh, hormones and uh, this hormones is uh, adrenaline. Uh, in, in fact, in this oil, if you read what this oil was uh, consistent of, you will find uh, five uh, ingredients in this oil. And if you look in the uh, medical books, what uh, 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 what uh, this adrenal gland secrete, you will find they secrete five different hormones because everything correlates to you know to the minute uh, data, uh, details. So the main function of adrenaline is called fight and flight uh, hormone, and it's uh, the function is for our human uh, body to perform uh, flawlessly because when you when the person is in extreme uh, situation let's say uh, the little uh, kid gets uh, under the car so the uh, woman who doesn't have much strength can lift up this car kind of getting this adrenal uh, rash during and especially after this uh, action is taking place. So the function is the same. Now, between the court roundabout and the holy place, it was the veil in the tabernacle. This veil had three colors because God, Yahweh, uh, told Moses to uh, show how to make it and told him to make it this way. It's, uh, it's described in the Bible. It's not the fantasy. The color is red, purple, and scarlet. I mean, blue, purple, and scarlet, sorry. Blue, purple, and scarlet. So in a, uh, our physical body, what is, there is also veil between our abdominal cavity and our chest cavity. And this veil, it's a muscle, a big muscle, which is called diaphragm. And as this veil was moving with the wind uh, uh, in the holy place, the same way our diaphragm is moving with the wind or with our breath. Now, a uh, uh, diaphragm is uh, fed by uh, arteries, uh, which is a uh, uh, red color, uh, 
via, via veins, which has blue color and has a big uh, net of capillaries, capillaries. And capillaries are in mixed uh, blood between uh, 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 oxygenated and disoxygenated blood. So they depicted in the anatomy atlas as a purple in color. So we have a, a blue, uh, purple, and scarlet veil in our physical body. Now, there were three vessels, uh, three main vessels in the tabernacle. So one of them, it was the uh, lampstead. This lampstead consisted of uh, uh, seven branches, as you can see on this picture. Three branches were paired, and one branch was standing alone. And uh, the function of this uh, lampstead was to give light in this uh, tabernacle. So the light was kind of flickering in this tabernacle when it was burned. Now, in uh, our chest cavity, there is an aortic arch which uh, goes out of the heart. Now, aortic arch, if you look at the anatomy atlas, it consists of seven branches. Three of them are paired, and one of them stands alone. And there are names of it, subclaviculus branches and uh, uh, brachial uh, branches. You can know the name of these branches. But it's, it's the same, you know, seven uh, branches structure. And the function of this uh, aortic arch is to pulsate or to deliver the uh, pulsating blood from the heart to, uh, to the organs. And in fact, when uh, uh, the, the opening of the blood vessel, if you look there in the anatomy atlas, atlas, which is in Latin, the way I learned it in the medical school. So if you look how the opening of the blood vessels is called, it's called lumen in Latin. And lumen in Latin means light. So there is a principle of light in the blood vessels, as you can see, uh, light in the uh, tabernacle. Now, another vessel in a holy place was the table of the shoe, uh, uh, show bread. It was uh, four in, uh, uh, four, uh, has four uh, angles or four parts, and it was two loaves of, uh, of uh, bread, uh, and it was, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 12 loaves of bread for the, each loaf for one tribe of children of Israel. It was a sustenance uh, for, uh, for the priests. And uh, it was a golden crown going uh, on this uh, table. So Yahweh told Moses to put the golden crown there. So it correlates with the heart. Heart, uh, why it correlates with the heart? Because the function of this uh, uh, table of the shoe bread with the bread was a sustenance or to give a food uh, to the priest, like the function of the uh, heart is to give uh, the food which delivers with the uh, blood vessels uh, from digested food to the organs, to feed uh, the organs. And the heart has four uh, sections in the heart, uh, arteriums and ventricles. And uh, so on, on this it, uh, heart, if you're uh, open the heart, let's say it's not only with humans, like with a, a chicken, for example, you will find the fatty tissue like golden in color, yellowish uh, in color. And this is a coronary artery and coronary means crown. So we have a crown going across of our heart the same well, way as it was a, a, a golden crown going across this uh, table of the shoe bread. So the last uh, section in the holy place, it was another altar 
not the altar of sin sacrifice, but it was the altar of incense. So the high priest uh, had to bring incense and burn it uh, to Yahweh and uh, say uh, prayers at this altar. Now this incense uh, consists of the four uh, main ingredients and only high priest knew how to compose this four main ingredients. Now in our, it correlates with uh, our lungs and we breathe the air. Air consists of the uh, four main ingredients. It's uh, oxygen, uh, carbon uh, dioxide, uh, nitrogen, and uh, hydrogen. And, uh, and there are some other ingredients, of course, but there are four main ingredients. And nobody knows you know, the composition, the uh, exact composition of the air, as nobody knew the, except the high priest of composition of the air. Now, high priest is our creator. He knows the composition of the air. And now look how it's testifying to our creator. And it was addressed in the moderation a little bit. So four main ingredients were used to uh, say uh, prayers to our heavenly father. Now the name of our heavenly father is Yahweh. In Hebrew, there are four letters. It's Yad, uh, Wav, Yad, Hey, Wav, Hey. And uh, uh, so and it's, uh, to, to pronounce it, it's Yahweh. Now, when we uh, breathe this air, we also give the prayer whether we, whether we know this or don't know. Why? Because we are saying the name Yahweh. In the last book of Psalms, we read Psalms 19 uh, in the scripture reading, but if you read the very last book of Psalms, which is 150 and very last verse, it reads, let's everything which has breath Praise Yahweh. So when we breathe, we actually uh, uh, breathe the name of our creator, Yahweh. If you listen to it, so I'm just forcing it a little bit, but when you're quiet, when you go to bed and quiet at the night, uh, listen how you breathe and you will see, you will hear rather then you breathe the name of Yahweh. Now, between the holy place and the most holy place, it was another veil. And it was blue, purple, and scarlet veil. Now, in our physical body, between the holy place, which is the chest cavity, and the most holy place, which is the head uh, cavity, uh, there is a neck. Now, neck consists of... Uh, big arteries, which are red, and uh, uh, big uh, veins, which are blue, but there is no capillaries in the, uh, in the neck. However, what we find in the neck, and we, uh, our creator, he could put it in a different part of the body, it really doesn't have to be in the neck, but it is in the neck. It is a thyroid gland. And thyroid gland uh, secret iodine. And if you look up what iodine means, it means purple. The test of for iodine is purple smoke. So there is a principle of purple uh, with the iodine, with the thyroid gland in our neck. So you see blue, purple, and scarlet testifying that we are made by the pattern we correlate with the tabernacle. And to remind you, if, if I forget to tell you, this tabernacle pattern, as I said, it was described in the Bible. Now think about it. It was described in detail 3,500 years ago when the people had no clue how the physical body 
made not to say how it operates. And we can go and talk about it on molecular level as well and on the cellular level. Uh, now, when we go to, uh, to the most holy place in the tabernacle, oh, I forgot. Uh, let me, uh, let me, uh, well, okay, let me continue and then I'll do what I wanted to do. Uh, in the most holy place, there are, uh, were three in one configuration. So it was uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which with the 10 commandment law, many people know about 10 commandment law, even those who don't know the Bible, it's called 10 commandments. It was inside of this altar of, uh, uh, not altar, Ark of the Covenant. And it was two figurines of uh, cherubs or angels, which uh, was made, you know, golden angels, which was made in this ark. And Yahweh said that he will show himself as a cloud between the wings of these angels. No, so it was like a cloud uh, between the wings of the angels. So it correlates with our chest cavity. So our, uh, with our brain, our brain consists of the uh, gray and white matter. And our brain doesn't have any particular form. It has kind of a convoluted form. And like a cloud doesn't have any particular form and it's uh, nothing else but white and gray matter. Now these angels in this uh, tabernacle, the angels, which are uh, kind of looking at the creator who depicts himself as a cloud, they are Michael and Gabriel. These are two main angels or archangels which are described in the Bible. Now, Michael was the warrior and Gabriel was the messenger. Now, the two functions of our brain is uh, the uh, 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 I'm losing uh, the word. It's a uh, motory, motory and function. Thank you. Mot Thank you. It's motory function, which would be like a warrior or like uh, Michael, man of action, a uh, motory function and sensory function, which would be likened to uh, Gabriel. Now, within uh, this uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant, there were 10 commandment laws. Now, if you look at the 10 commandment laws, the way they described in the Bible, you will find that the three, there were two, uh, two tables of stone and there were three laws uh, pertaining to Yahweh and the other seven laws, it's about the uh, people or how, how, what they should do regarding themselves and what they shouldn't do. Now, this uh, Ten Commandment laws, there were laws for the body of Israel, how they should live their life. Now, in our uh, brain, there is a pituitary gland and pituitary gland secretes hormones. These hormones are the laws of our body, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. When the time to grow, it's growth hormone, but there is time to lactate for the woman. This is a, a lactating a hormone. And there are the, uh, 10 hormones in pituitary gland. And there are two uh, parts of uh, sections or lobes, I should say, of pituitary glands functionally, arteria and posterior. And if you look at the some medical books, you will find there are 10 hormones and seven are produced with one lobe and uh, uh, three are produced by another lobe. So to uh, repeat it in the court roundabout, there's a principle of sacrifice with the altar of uh, uh, sacrifice. There's a principle of cleansing with the, uh, uh, in both uh, tabernacle and of our physical body. 
there is a principle of quickening with the tabernacle and on the human body with the uh, uh, adrenal gland. There's a principle of uh, light in both human body and the tabernacle. The principle of food in both tabernacle and the human body. And the principle of intercession or uh, breathing or praying to Yahweh in a, in a human body, it's exchanging of oxygenated uh, uh, blood, uh, oxygen with uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, this uh, is a happening place uh, in the lungs. Uh, there are principle of uh, uh, witnesses. There are two uh, witnesses, uh, Mo uh, Michael and Gabriel, and uh, motory and uh, sensory uh, functions uh, of the brain, of the brain, principle of the law and hormones in a, a physical uh, body. And there is also principle of uh, unity because remember it was three in one configuration show that our uh, creator is unified, it's unity. And there is unity principle of uh, unity in the brain because this brain, this nervous system is unifying the whole body because this, uh, without this nervous system, you know, with this impulses uh, in throughout the whole uh, body, we can, cannot uh, function well. So now that's, you know, let me go back to it. So the short summary I want to make here is that look, this tabernacle is described 3,500 years ago by Moses. It's documented when it's described. This anatomy and physiology, we know like when it's 10 hormones, when the pituitary gland, it's within the last 50 years, this knowledge uh, became av available and all other knowledge about it. So you have to, you know, ask yourself the question, why? Why there is a, such a striking similarity between uh, the human body and this tabernacle pattern? And what we are trying to show you uh, in this class and what, what was revealed to the founder of this class is that God or Yahweh, the creator, he made everything, you and me, tabernacle and history, as I will uh, show you next, according to the same pattern. And why? Because it's all uh, uh, testifying about invisible principles of uh, him. And I'll touch upon it uh, shortly. So going back to the same uh, story, and there are many stories of the Bible, but this is one example how the Bible, and this is a true story which happened uh, in the history of uh, uh, Israel nation. You can, uh, it's archeology span confirms it, but it's uh, also described in the Bible. So it goes according to the same pattern. You remember first it was blood with four points of blood. So during Passover season, which, uh, uh, was celebrated uh, on the Friday, several days ago. So the children of Israel had to pull, kill the lamb and put uh, three points of blood on the door of the lamb. And it was a basin with blood uh, at, uh, at the door. So you see this four points of blood, the same as we saw in the tabernacle, in the, as in the human body. It's what is testified for. The principle is that something innocent need to die. So the guilty uh, or the person will leave. It's testifying, as you can see on this chart, to Jesus Christ, whose true name is Yahshua, the Messiah. So he was innocent. He was the innocent sacrifice. He was Yahweh himself or God himself who came to the earth plane in the physical body to die for you and me 
because we were all sinners. We didn't know God and our conscience was telling us that what we were doing was wrong. So he died for us. So therefore, if we believe in him or if we eat him, so to speak, what I mean, take him inside, take his truth, his teaching we are sharing with you inside, then you can leave. That's what all these witnesses testifying for. So another thing, according to this tabernacle pattern, what happening after sacrifice, after blood? Water, cleansing. And uh, so therefore children of Israel has to go through the Red Sea. And it was a cleansing in the Red Sea because they came out and uh, Egyptians died in the Red Sea. And I'll talk about it uh, in the end. I think I'll have about I would like to talk 10 more minutes and then I will be done. And uh, it's uh, also pointing again, what's the spiritual principle? It's that the truth or the truth about our heavenly father, the gospel, which we read in the Bible, it's cleansing us from all our erroneous uh, doctrines, from my atheism that God doesn't exist, or if you think God exists, so you may think that God exists like Michelangelo painted on this painting I showed that he's a, some man in the sky, which is not true. So that's what cleansing is pointing out to. And then you remember the next one, it was uh, anointing oil, the principle of uh, uh, quickening. So, and or the principle of spirit. And in this, it was the cloud who led the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt, that it was the angel in the cloud, which is the spirit. And this, uh, uh, that's what uh, uh, this uh, anointing oil was pointing out to. And it was a quickening of children of Israel or children of Israel, quickening means made alive. So they made the life, how? Because they were dead as a slaves, kind of dead in the slavery, uh, symbolically speaking. And they came out to uh, freedom, to the wilderness of Sinai. Now in this wilderness of Sinai, which is likened to the holy place, it was light all the time because it was uh, light during the day, but it was Yahweh was this big cloud depicted here it was the fiery cloud during the night. So you can see the principle of light there. They were always uh, at, uh, in the light in this wilderness. And uh, what's uh, the principle when uh, we uh, hear the gospel, hear the teaching, this is the light. We are not in the darkness anymore. We are not serving the flesh or serving our traditions or whoever we serve in our spiritual uh, Egypt, we are coming out of it, like coming to school, believe it or not, it would be like coming out of the world to the wilderness, because in the wilderness, they were learning about Yahweh. He, he gave them his law. So we are learning about Yahweh. And you, you have a chance to learn about your creator and be right with him here to have his light. And the same is the food. There were manna in the wilderness. All time they were in the wilderness for 40 years. They had the manna, which is the bread. So it was the bread uh, in the uh, tabernacle. It was uh, hard is the principle of bread or feeding the body. And you see manna as the bread and we are when you uh, learn about Yahweh, you are taken in the spiritual food. And then they go to another veil, which is the river Jordan. And they uh, have like, uh, you know, unity is being manifested because they become uh, kind of united uh, with their creator and glorifying him, uh, building this uh, uh, temple uh, to him. So the Bible uh, stories are going according to the same 
uh, pattern. So uh, believe it or not, but uh, <clears throat> the current events are going according to the same pattern because what uh, you know, Yahweh, our creator, he didn't stop 2000 years ago, you know, with the uh, Yahshua, the Messiah, or with the time when the uh, Bible, Bible was uh, written, he has continued uh, to show his purpose. And that's uh, finally, I will, uh, in the final, I will, finally I'll show two, two things about it. Take the war with Ukraine, which is going on right now. Uh, now with the war with Ukraine, let me go back here. Again, you see the blood here, principle of blood in the tabernacle, principle of water and principle of spirit here, blood, water, spirit. And there is a lot about it, uh, you know, to explain about it. I'm just showing you, you know, the kind of elementary things about it. And uh, then in the uh, holy place, there is a principle of uh, uh, 40. I don't have much time to talk about it, but in the many Bible stories, you will find that in this holy place, there is a 40, like children of Israel were in the wilderness of Sinai for 40 years, or during the flood, there were 40 days and 40 nights and so on. So with the war in Ukraine, there is a lot of blood is going on uh, 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 right now. And uh, there is, of course, there is a uh, water because people, you know, the relatives of those who uh, uh, were killed in the war, they're, cl uh, they're crying over those who are killed. And also there is a principle of spirit and uh, people talk about all the time from the beginning of the war about the uh, high spirit of Ukrainian people with the president uh, Zelensky. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the first uh, several weeks of the war, we were reading about this uh, convoy of Russian tanks uh, near Kiev, and it was a 40 mile convoy. It was all the time talking about uh, 40 uh, with this convoy. So you see blood, water, spirit, 40. Uh, with this uh, war. Uh, now, let me talk to you about other thing which uh, you'll find uh, interesting. So during this Passover uh, holiday, uh, which is happening, was happening several days ago, uh, uh, children of Israel, where it was a Passover from the old world uh, uh, from uh, to, to this new world, to, so to speak, or from Egypt uh, to the freedom, to the wilderness of Sinai, and then to Canaan's land. Now, when they crossed uh, the Red Sea, children of Israel, the uh, Pharaoh and Egyptians were going after them. And uh, Yahweh let children of Israel go through the dry ground on the, on the dry ground. But when the Egyptians uh, started uh, following them, he uh, kind of put these waters uh, back together on them and they all drowned. So this old world kind of uh, drowned. It was like a, a death of this old world. And by the way, this chart, it's not the just history. It's uh, talking about our spiritual exodus, our, our spiritual Passover from death unto life. And the life is to know our creator, to know our heavenly father. That's the first aim of the school. That's the goal. But first we have to give you the witnesses that he is real and the bible is the true book so you saw this witnesses how this thing is described in the bible 3500 years ago and you describe and you decide for yourself whether it's true or not but going back go to go back to this exodus so that's the story 
Now, Dr. Kinley was talking about that what happened during Passover, because it was a very global spiritual event, it's going to repeat itself over and over again with the history, with now our history, with the modern history. Now, can somebody read to me what's on the screen? So what I am showing here, Dr. Kinley was preaching the gospel. He gave many lectures and those lectures were transcribed. So this is a transcription if, uh, if, uh, of one of the lecture given in 1964 called Day of the Lord. Okay, Dr. Kinley says, now I told you that there would be a reflection on the 10th day of April, 14th day of April, I did say. I told you about that before it came to pass, come to pass. And that reflection was manifest itself. No, no, in I'm, the I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, I interrupted for a second. I forgot to tell that the exodus of children of Israel happened on uh, April 14th, but on April 10th, they had to bring the lamb to be inspected. So it's from April 10th to April 14th, pretty much. Continue on now. Now it will be more uh, clear why he's talking about April 14th. Start reading from the beginning, please. Okay. Now I told you that there would be a reflection on the 10th day of April, 14th day of April, I did say. I told you about that before it come to pass. And that reflection was manifest itself in the depths, in the waters. That thresher, that sub, did it sink on the 14th day of April? It was the 10th of April, that, that submarine thresher. Now, let me, let me say this to you. Now, this is what I was looking at. That lamb down in Egypt was drawn out of the flock on the 10th. I did not set that day up and was slain on the 14th, ate on the 14th. Now, when Jesus Christ was crucified out there on the cross, that day, Good Friday, as it is called, there was an earthquake. Well, now, nobody nowhere, call your preacher, teacher, deacon, what have you, has paid any attention to them signs that come down on those days. There's always got to be a reflection. Every year, there's got to be some kind of a reflection. Why? Because God is accurate and operates the same way all the time without any changes. His purpose must come down through the dispensations and ages that way. Now that's what makes up the history of the world. That's what makes it up. Now I brought that up so you can see, so that you could understand. And you might as well get ready because we'll read some of this out of the Bible. Thank you. So Dr. Kinley was talking about uh, the treasure. So what, if you don't know, the treasure was an American uh, submarine. And this uh, submarine, if you look it up, it was the lead boat. It was like the main boat of her class in the nuclear uh, submarines in the United States. And this submarine uh, drowned or got uh, sunk uh, to, on uh, uh, April 10th in 1963, or during the time of the Passover. Now, Dr. Kinley is talking about Jesus Christ. Back then, he didn't use the true names yet because it wasn't time uh, yet, but Yahshua the Messiah correctly. He was crucified during the Passover uh, time, and it was earthquake when uh, he was uh, crucified. And again, the earthquake signifies removal of the flesh or end of uh, physical, if you look uh, at this uh, earthquake. Now, it was uh, uh, another uh, 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 big uh, ship called Titanic. Everybody knows about Titanic, especially after this great movie uh, came out about uh, Titanic. Titanic was the biggest uh, ship uh, at that 
particular time. But what happened on uh, the night of April 14th and morning of April 15th, on the night of uh, April 14th, this uh, uh, Titanic struck an iceberg and got sink and drowned uh, in the ocean again on April 14th as Passover time. That's what Dr. Kinley is talking about. It has to be reflected over and over again. And what we see now, what happens several days ago on April 14th, the leading Russian military ship of Black Sea called Moskva. Moskva means the capital of Russia. Again, signifies you know, the leadership of Russia. And Russia represents this old world compared to Ukraine, which are fighting for the freedom. And in this sense, they represent uh, Israel, uh, who were kind of uh, uh, getting delivered you know, uh, to the freedom. So this uh, Russian ship got uh, sunk, got drowned uh, in the sea, showing forth that Yahweh is real and he is in control of whatever is happening uh, in this world, including our life. And the more you learn about him, the more you come to these classes to learn about him, the more and more you will understand about his purpose. And I should say, based on my own experience, the happier and happier you will become. So thank you for your attention and praise be to Yashua. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening will please be Dr. Dennis Volpe, Dean of our Oceanside, California branch school. Uh, good evening. I am assuming, of course, uh, that everybody can hear me. And if you can't, just indicate so. Yes. We're good. All right. Well, that was a uh, quite an introduction to this teaching. And I thought that uh, uh, Dr. Rachmalevich did a wonderful job of expressing some of the tenets of this teaching that the world does not know. They do not know these things. Now, uh, first of all, let me ask you this. Do we have a first-time visitor visiting tonight? Yes. yes, we do. We do. Okay, great. So let me continue in that vein of what uh, was expressed by uh, Sasha. And what I'd like to do is this. I'd like to take you, well, I want to stay right on this chart, but I also want to take you back over to this scripture, Romans 1, 19 and 20. Now, tonight in our scripture reading, we read that the heavens declare the glory of Yahweh and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Day unto day, they're uttering speech and night unto night, they're showing forth knowledge. Now, Paul said something later on uh, here uh, after the time that uh, David had written that Psalms. Here comes Paul now after Pentecost, the time when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place. And Paul is expressing the understanding of what we read in Psalms, the 19th chapter. And this is very crucial because this point that Paul makes sets up a foundation of learning for you to see how this teaching really is opening up to you the mystery of Yahweh or God's will. Now, let's go ahead and start at Romans 1, 19 and 20, please. Romans 1, 19. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. Now, there's one thing right there that was just said in that first verse. He said, that which may be known of God or of Yahweh. Now, in most religions, especially the religion I was raised in, and, and throughout Christianity, we are taught that you can't know anything about God till after you die and go to heaven. You just have to believe and accept that God is real, that he exists, and believe in God with what they call blind faith. Now, what Paul is saying is something can be known about your creator. In fact, 
I'm going to show you a little later why it's crucial that you do know something about your Creator. And he said, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, read, for Yahweh has showed it unto them. Now, whatever can be known, God has to show it to us. Mankind does not have the ability to intellectually deduce knowledge of the Creator. The Creator himself must reveal himself to us in order for us to know him. Now, Paul had an experience that he talks about in the Bible, there's a book in the Bible in the New Testament called Acts of the Apostles. And in that book, Paul talks about how he was caught up and had a vision and a subsequent revelation. And he's speaking now based on the vision that was shown to him. Now, when Sasha told you that this school was basically set up and founded based on a vision and revelation imparted to our founder... That's what Yahweh did all the way down through the Bible. Every one of the so-called stories and patriarchs, Yahweh would appear to them and show them a vision or give them instructions. Now, he did that with Noah, and he showed Noah a vision of the flood and instructed him how to make a ark uh, that would bring about the salvation of mankind or, or at, let's say, the human race and even the animals. Now, he also gave a vision to Moses on top of Mount Sinai that we're seeing on this chart about a pattern that Sasha just got up here and talked about. In fact, in the Bible, that tabernacle is referred to as a pattern. And what God did, or Yahweh did, is in this cloud up here on top of Mount Sinai, Yahweh showed Moses that he transformed into, Yahweh Elohim, transformed into a building that we just heard described called the tabernacle, then back inside unto himself to show that the tabernacle was a structure that was basically explaining something about himself. Because at the top of this chart, you read that Elohim is the archetype original pattern of the universe. Elohim is the title that they use as God in the Bible, but that was the title Yahweh chose for himself. Now, he is the pattern. Now, what, what Moses also sees on top of Mount Sinai coming forth from that point is the, the, the creation itself coming out according to that pattern. Now, that pattern, that tabernacle, actually Elohim was the blueprint or the pattern by which all things are made. And everything that exists is following this pattern. And it is expressing, to some extent, the reality of what Yahweh is and how Yahweh Elohim exists. All of that is being revealed by this organized pattern and that we're able to apply to both science and to the Bible itself. Now, that's what we're trying to show you down here. We're trying to show you there's a way to know. Now, Paul said, because that which may be known uh, of him is manifest them, for Yahweh has showed it unto them. Read 20, please. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, let's just examine that statement for a minute. He says the invisible things of him. Now, the word invisible means that you can't see it. Now, how can you clearly see something that you can't see? He said the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, how can you clearly see something you can't see? Go ahead and finish, Andrea. Being understood by the things that are made. Now, listen, here's how Yahweh is expressing his invisible self or existence. Now, first of all, I have to have another scripture read. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, Michelle, running over to John 4.23, please. Will do. John 4 and 23. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now here's Yahshua. Here's Joshua speaking to a Samaritan woman at a well 
who was an Israelite, by the way, and he said that the time is going to come when Yahweh is going to seek the true worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, watch the next statement. Read. For the Father seeks such to worship him. Yahweh is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, what he said is that Yahweh is spirit. Well, here's the thing about spirit. If you go to a priest, a minister, uh, an archbishop, I don't care, the pope, I don't care who you go to, and ask them, what is spirit? They usually give you some kind of an answer like this. Well, God is spirit, because that's what we just read in the Bible. And then he say, well, okay, then what is God? They'll say, well, God is spirit and spirit is God. In other words, they never actually explain to you what spirit is because they don't know. Now, the problem there is that the Messiah said that Yahweh is spirit and they that worship him must worship him, not should worship him. Or if you choose to, he said they must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what our founder expressed to us is this. This is what was shown to him in his vision that Yahweh exists in a state which we will call or he referred to as pure spirit. And in that state, he was inscrutable and incomprehensible, meaning in that state, he didn't have a describable shape and form that you could draw a picture of on a blackboard. In fact, you couldn't even grasp what spirit is while he's in that state. Now, here's what it is. Yahweh exists in a state without discernible shape and form, and what he is is he's divine attributes. And this is all talked about down through your Bible, that Yahweh, the spirit of Yahweh is knowledge, wisdom, intelligence, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, and strength. Now, those are known as divine attributes. Now, Yahweh doesn't have knowledge. He's the very substance of knowledge. He doesn't have intelligence. He's the very substance of intelligence. And that goes for each one of those attributes that I, that I just uh, spoke about. Now, what I want you to know is those attributes are also infinite. There is no measure of the quantity of knowledge that Yahweh has. It's infinite knowledge, infinite intelligence. Now, being that he is in this great state where he is those actual attributes themselves without descriptive shape and form, what he desired to do is to bring about creatures that he would then make himself known to them and realizing that in that totality state of pure spirit, it would be impossible for any creature to grasp the enormity of it. He elected to condense himself into a lesser state. So he, through, through, uh, uh, through transmutation of spirit, he took on a form known as, as we say, Yahweh Elohim, which is shown to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. In that vision, they saw him with hands, feet, and a body. Now that is Yahweh taking on a shape and form that can be seen in visions and revelations with a portion of his intelligence that will be manifested through that embodiment, a portion of his wisdom, his knowledge, and his love, and his justice. All of those attributes are going to be condensed proportionately through that body that will express what Yahweh is in totality. Now that vision, visionary and body, appeared to men down through the Bible. And it was referred to in the Bible as the word of God or the word of Yahweh. That word was the visionary form that spoke to Moses and told him to build that tabernacle. That tabernacle was a physical example that would illustrate those spiritual principles of the divine attributes that I just expressed. Now, once you understand this operation of how Yahweh is transmuting from a state of impossibility of understanding or being able to scrutinize to a state where he could be understood and be able to be scrutinized, we start to understand that that is the beginning of Yahweh's purpose. Now, 
Here's what Elohim did. Elohim created everything after his own image and likeness. Not just the man that uh, that uh, 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 Dr. Rachmalevich just got up and expressed to you the threefold makeup of man, which represents the threefold makeup of Yahweh Elohim himself. Now, the threefold makeup of Yahweh Elohim isn't cranium, thoracic, and abdomen, as it is with man. But he is spirit, soul, and body. He is that the spirit of Yahweh functioning through a soul, which is the divine nature that is expressing those divine attributes, and in a spiritual embodiment. Now, that spirit, soul, and body, when, when Elohim created Adam, Adam was also threefold, not just cranium, thoracic, and abdomen, but man is also spirit, soul, and body. Now, the physical body is an outward manifestation of the spiritual makeup of the Creator Himself, and also you are in that body, the soul, which was formed from spirit itself. Now, what I want you to do is this. Uh, uh, Andrea, go back to Romans 1.20 again, if you would read that, please. You want me to start 20 all over again? Well, go ahead, start 19. What the heck? Okay. Romans 119, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh has showed it unto them. Now, as I said, when Yahweh wanted to reveal anything about himself, he did it through this embodiment known as Yahweh Elohim, which was able to communicate with mankind in visions and revelations. Now, he showed it to men down through the Bible, things that would express the divine attributes of Yahweh in that pure spirit state. Again, not in totality. You could never grasp the enormity or the totality of divine intelligence or wisdom. It has to be given to you piecemeal in your understanding. Now, keep reading, Andrea, 20. 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, the invisible things are that substance of spirit. Now, I want you to know another thing about spirit. Not only is Yahweh the sum total of all those divine attributes, but everything that exists originated from spirit itself. Spirit is the source, substance, and limits and bounds of all things that exist, including the entire universe. When we talk about the Big Bang and we say that the universe exploded into existence, but nobody knows what existed prior to that Big Bang. Well, I'm telling you, we know. Spirit is the source by which energy and matter came forth from. And Yahweh is actually all things that exist in the universe. He's the star, he's the moon, he's the sun, he's even you, but you're not conscious of it. Everything is Yahweh's spirit materialized. Now, he is the source and substance of all things, and that's in your Bible also. I'm not going to have it read for sake of time, but over in the 17th chapter of Acts of the Apostles, Paul was speaking to the Greeks, and he told them that we, he said, for in Yahweh we live, move, and have our existence or our being, for we are also his offspring. Everything that exists has come forth from spirit and is nothing more than spirit now in a materialized, concrete manifestation. So that everything that Yahweh Elohim created from spirit is going to somehow be a demonstration or manifestation of a spiritual invisible principle that you can't see. So when Paul says, for the invisible things of him, he's talking about the spiritual essence of Yahweh or the, the, the divine attributes themselves. In fact, I could even put it to you like this. If I were to ask you, let's say you had artistic ability, and I asked you to go up to a canvas and draw me what knowledge looks like. You can't describe what knowledge looks like. You can't make a square, a, a circle, or any other shape that will illustrate knowledge. Well, then how do you know what knowledge is? How do you know what love is? People say all the time, well, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then, of course, they don't 
manifest that. They're, they, they could be mean to you or uh, not affectionate or whatever the case might be. What I'm showing you is those attributes cannot be described in the sense of shape, form, quantity, but here's how you know them. They have to be manifested in some capacity. They have to be demonstrated so that when you see the application of knowledge, you understand what you have just seen is something that's invisible made known to you through demonstration. And even love. If somebody uses the term, I love you, and then they're tender with you, they're, uh, 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 they're, they're, I'll use the term loving, they're patient, they're kind, and all the other things that we look for, affectionate. Those demonstrations allow you to comprehend the love that was in that person that you can't see. Now, what Paul is talking about, the invisible things of Yahweh, are those divine attributes. Now, what he did was he created everything to demonstrate those attributes. Therefore, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. What it means is this. The seeing that he talks about is not seeing with your eyeballs and your occipital lobe in your brain. What he's talking about is seeing meaning understanding or seeing with the mind's eye, as we call it. So therefore, the creation, through understanding the things that are made by the creator, you are seeing the demonstration of the divine attributes that he really is, you are now clearly seeing in your mind's eye what you can't see with your natural physical eye because it's manifested. So when people say, well, if God is real, why can't I see him? Well, over there in Psalms we read that the heavens declare the glory of Yahweh, the firmament that showeth his handiwork, day unto day utter its speech, night unto night showeth forth knowledge. Now how many of us heard the speech of the creation declaring the creator? How many of us saw the knowledge of the creation that is revealing the creator? We were walking in a creation in our lives, essentially blind and deaf, about the actual reality of what everything is that exists and how it demonstrates Yahweh himself. Now, in order for you to be able to see these, uh, make these uh, uh, leaps, I'll say, from seeing the physical creation and universe and uh, even things about yourself to seeing the spiritual essence of it requires something. So I want, uh, 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 I want, if you don't mind, Michelle, I want you to go back to the 19th chapter of Psalms again, and I want you to read those first few verses so I can make this uh, crucial point here. Okay, Psalms 19 and 1. The heavens declare the glory of Yahweh, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now, it doesn't matter whether you live in the United States, Russia, you live in Antarctica, New Zealand. It doesn't matter. The creation is telling us all the same thing and showing us all the same thing. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Read. Verse 4. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Read. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Right there. Right there. He's explaining to you that, just listen, if somebody comes up and speaks a language you're not able to understand, you're not familiar with the language, what you need is an interpreter. You need somebody that speaks your language and understands the language that's being spoken so that you can have a connection of the two minds that are communicating. Now, in this case, Yahweh is communicating with mankind through a language that we don't understand. When we're born into this world, we don't hear the creation speaking. We don't see the knowledge that it's trying to illustrate. But the tabernacle was a structure that he made that is an organized system of principles demonstrated by the construction and actual uh, operation of the priesthood within that tabernacle, which we'll teach you about if you keep coming down here. You will start to see how all these principles that are, that are manifested in this pattern are exactly what the creation itself is expressing through science and even through our everyday lives. We'll see it with circumstances in our lives. 
as you start to see that, that is now giving you, an uh, it's like an interpreter that is ex explaining to you so you can understand the language Yahweh is speaking. And that's what this class is going to do. It's going to open up to you to such a degree of how much the creation witnesses to the reality of Yahweh's existence that you will have your eyes, of, in other words, your eyes will be open now and you'll have a conscious awareness of the ever-presence of Yahweh from that point forward. That's what our hope is with everyone that comes down, that they stay down here long enough and just give this a try. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to go to a, a boot camp for uh, several months a year so we can just drill this in. No, this is all you learning at your own pace. You don't have to join anything, and you don't have to give us money for it. It's free. What we want you to pay is attention when you come down here. If you do that, this is going to really broaden your awareness of what the reality of life is. Now, Paul said that uh, uh, day unto day, uh, no, that's, uh, uh, excuse me, that was uh, David, but going back to Paul, Paul said that uh, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. By us looking at what he made, it will illustrate the invisible principles of Yahweh as he actually is and truthfully exists. And it will make this thing real to you. It's not just about you believing in a God and accepting, well, maybe there's a God and I better believe in him. No, this will become real. You will see this operating right within your own life to such a degree that you'll know that Yahweh is in control of his creation. Now, let, let me take you somewhere else with this. Let's go to uh, uh, um, uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Now, here's another thing that our founder taught us. That Yahweh masterminded before he brought anything into existence, before he took on that lesser state of himself known as Yahweh Elohim, he masterminded an entire purpose and plan. And that purpose and plan, ladies and gentlemen, is going to play out and be demonstrated down through ages and dispensations of time with various things that were that happened that you'll read about down through your Bible. And what I want you to recognize is that that purpose and plan of Yahweh is a mystery. The world does not know how Yahweh's purpose operates and really what it is. But the Holy Spirit, after it was poured out upon mankind, after the death, burial, resurrection of the one that the world called Jesus Christ, correctly Yahshua, that spirit's job was to reveal the purpose of Yahweh in operation. And once you recognize that Yahweh has a purpose and how it works, you're going to find out everything's going to open up to you. You're going to become conscious of a spiritual, metaphysical operation and see that everything in the world is under the control of, of Yahweh himself. He is not passively sitting back somewhere in the universe. In fact, Yahweh does not a, does not a, uh, live in the in the uh, what we call the the universe that we live in. The truth is the universe exists inside of him. Not him living in the universe. The universe lives in him. Now what I want you to realize is is that uh, we're going to start to show you some things here that is uh, going to be a real uh, may, it'll really be an eye-opener if you catch on to these principles. Now, 46, 9, and 10, please. This is what Yahweh Elohim says in uh, the book of Isaiah, who was a prophet. Read. Isaiah 46 and 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am Yahweh, and there is none else. I am Yahweh, and there is none like me. Now, there's nothing else that exists but Yahweh. There is no other gods. All the gods that we read about down through history that various civilizations worship are fictional in their own mind. Yahweh is the only source and substance of everything that exists. And he said, there's none like me. Read. 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. Now, he has declared the end right from the beginning. Read. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, 
my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now here's what we got. Now uh, Sasha just got done showing you how on the uh, the founder talked about on the 10th and the 14th of April, we have these things that pop up almost every year that give us an eye opener of Yahweh's purpose and operation during that time of Passover. Now what I want you to know is that Yahweh has set up things that are declared right from the beginning. And the end is declared from the beginning, so everything is his purpose unfolding down through time. From the point of the universe being brought into existence to the point of when it ends its existence, Yahweh has already declared every event in the universe. And nothing is happening by happenstance or arbitrarily. It's all under his control. How do you know that? Because everything that exists is his own substance of spirit, only in a materialized existence. Now, he controls all of his own substance. Therefore, everything that exists is following universal, what we refer to as universal spirit law, which science refers to as the law of nature. But Yahweh's in control of all of it. It's all his purpose unfolding, whether it be the universe and science, or whether it be down through the Bible with things that you read down through there. He said, I've declared the end from the beginning. Read. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now the word counsel. When you read, you, you go back into the dictionary, the Bible, there's a strong concordance that takes the word in Hebrew and shows you what that word means. What it means is purpose. His purpose is going to stand, and that purpose cannot be changed. It can't be altered. Therefore, he's declared the end from the beginning, and, uh, and, and everything is going to abide to his uh, uh, purpose that he has set in motion. And everything is following the purpose. And your life is part of the purpose. Your existence is part of the purpose. And as our founder used to use this analogy, he said, everybody has a part to play. Whether you believe or whether you don't believe. Whether you're conscious of Yahweh or you're not, you're playing exactly the part Yahweh has, has set up for you to play in his purpose. Now, there's a reason why we want to try to get this across to you to open up your understanding and make you cognizant of these things that we're trying to get across tonight. And that is because there is something that we, that you ha actually have a soul, and that soul is not physical, but it abides within this body, and when the body passes, that soul leaves the body, and that is not the end of the soul. The soul has an eternity of existence after this. Now, what I want to talk about is what state you're going to be in is important because what we want to happen is we all want to go into a state of peace and joy throughout eternity, and we want what is referred to in your Bible as eternal life. Now, let's go to, for a minute, John, the 17th chapter, and we're going to read verse 3. John 17 and 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true Elohim, and Yahshua the Messiah, whom thou hast sent. Now here's what we got. This is, now he, say, he didn't say this is the way you get eternal life. He said this is what it is. Eternal life is that you know Yahweh and Yahshua, whom the Father has sent. Your eternal life is to know the Father. Now the reason why that's important is because when Yahweh took on that shape and form as Elohim. And in the beginning of our moderation, you'll see that that's described as being the son of Yahweh. Now, the reason is, is because that shape and form is a lesser state of Yahweh. It's offspring of pure spirit, which a uh, son is offspring of its parents or its origin that it came from. Now, that son, his job is to make known the father. Now, uh, that knowledge is why you were put here in this world. You were put here to gain knowledge of Yahweh and his son, Yahweh Elohim, or Yahshua, who is Yahweh Elohim, by the way. Yahshua is Yahweh Elohim. 
Now, what I want you to know is that knowledge is your eternal life. Without it, you will not have eternal life. I see the five minute. And with it, you will have everlasting life, peace, and joy in your creator. And so Paul, Yahshua is saying here, this is the Messiah himself saying, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true Yahweh, and Yahshua the Messiah whom thou hast sent. Now, one other thing, go to uh, Matthew eleven twenty seven. Matthew 11 and 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Now this is Joshua speaking, and he said, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Read. And no man knows the Son but the Father. Now nobody knows the Son except the Father. In other words, no one knows Joshua except Yahweh. Read. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. The only one that knows Yahshua is the Father, and the only one that knows the Father is Yahshua. Read. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now, Yahshua has to reveal the Father to us. Now, that revelation of the Father to us through him is why he's the only intercessor between man and the Father. And listen, that revelation is what gives you the knowledge, or in other words, imparts the eternal life to your soul. So down here, what we want to do is try to pass this knowledge on to you and hope that it resonates in your heart and mind. We hope that the Father reveals himself to you through his son, Yahshua the Messiah, who is the Holy Spirit now, that is speaking through these vessels when we try to give these lectures and testimonies for you to be quickened in your heart and mind and have this become a conscious reality within you. And we have the knowledge to show you this, and we have the uh, irrefutable proof that these things are true. But we only ask you this. We can't explain everything to you about God or about Yahweh in 120 minutes. We ask you to return and give this a try and, and spend enough time to listen. We, we're only covering... Uh, what I call the skimming the surface of the knowledge that we teach in this teaching. We're trying to give you basically a fundamental overview of this teaching tonight. But trust me when I tell you, we can go into subjects that will be absolutely uh, uh, mind-blowing if you, if you just entertain these things. So I hope that something that was said tonight stimulated your thinking. I hope that it's brought some kind of... Uh, a provocative uh, thought that you might want to give to this and, and explore it and digest what you heard tonight. And please return again uh, because we'd love to be able to continue on and show you more. And so all I can say is thank you for the opportunity. I hope that what I said uh, was not too difficult to follow. And if you have any questions, you can ask me after the meeting. So I'm going to turn it back to the moderator. I thank you all for coming tonight, for listening. And peace in Yahshua, and I'll hand it back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. We hold Zoom classes every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, and we hope you will join us again. We will now be dismissed by the doxology taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Yahweh, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. <laughs>